Hi, it's John Taffer from Bar Rescue. Did you know the second building in America was a tavern? When I built my new restaurant franchise concept, Taffer's Tavern, I thought back to the roots of what makes a tavern a tavern. Timeless character. All while delivering an unbelievably delicious food and beverage experience. That paired with my 40 plus years in the industry provides a clear roadmap to success. Do you have what it takes to be a Taffer's Tavern franchisee? If so, I'd love to hear from you. Visit franchise.tafferstavern.com. Hear that? Is that America cheering or a sausage patty sizzling to perfection? It's time to cheer for Egg McMuffin and fresh cracked eggs at McDonald's. It's time to wake up to the aroma of freshly baked biscuits and treat yourself to a real honest-to-goodness morning meal. Breakfast, it's on at McDonald's. Now enjoy a large iced coffee for just 2 bucks and a breakfast sandwich to make a meal. Prices and participation may vary. Cannot be combined with any other offer or combo meal. Hey, and welcome to the HA Podcast. I'm Danny Sheriff the host of this podcast, the founder of the HA Society and an HA recovery coach who has walked wherever you currently are. This is the place to come if you care about getting your period regularly. This podcast aims to educate, inform and keep you motivated on your period and HA recovery track. I would love it if you could rate and review this podcast, five stars only, to help make this podcast easier for other women with HA to find it. And last thing, nothing from this show should be taken as medical advice. Please seek the advice of your physician. Are you listening to this show hoping to get some golden nuggets to help you on your way to recovery? Well, great. I hope that you find them because that is exactly what this show is for. But if you really want to take your recovery all the way, completely commit and get on track with your goals, whether they be finally feeling overall healthy finally getting pregnant or finally getting back to training, you'll want to join us inside of the HA Society. Not only is this the perfect community to ask questions and get your support and the accountability that you so often need during these uphill battles with body image and understanding nutrition and incorporating exercise, but it's also a hub of exclusive resources for HAs. All of the HA podcast episodes are released in advance and completely ad-free, so you can listen on the go to the raw, unedited versions, uninterrupted. All of the one-on-one coaching calls, of which we have two a week in different time zones, are uploaded to our private podcast feed so that you can listen to events with practitioners and the past community calls as though they were bonus podcast episodes, because I know how much you love to listen to this kind of stuff. And in these calls, we cover requested topics like overcoming the weight gain fears, communicating with friends and family about our HA, diving into how HA works, and debunking the imposter syndrome that so many of us have around this diagnosis. There's also an entire resources section with lectures, workshops, and training from the past events that are hosted by experts like Sarah Liz King, Laura Lyons, Kaylee McDevitt, Holly Dunn, and many more. As a member, you also get direct access to myself and Coach Ashley in the DMs. So if you have personal questions or need individualized advice about your recovery, we're in there answering your questions in the DMs, as are all of our other members in the group who impress me week after week with how they show up for each other it's incredible. It's like women are just all becoming mini coaches for each other. It's so good. The HA Society is really the place to be if you're going through recovery, no matter what stage you're at. Whether you have HA or you've got a few recovery periods, we have your back and we're all your new best friends. So come and meet us at thehasociety.com forward slash join. That's thehasociety.com forward slash join and the link is in the show notes for you okay on with the show those dang kids (laughs) (laughs) i mean doesn't care we're safely behind screens and many miles right (laughs) cool well hey everyone and welcome back to the ha podcast I have a return guest here, Dr. Heather Rhodes. We spoke down back on episode 47 about HA and PCOS. So if you guys are keen to like hear the beginning of that conversation, you haven't heard it before, scroll back to episode 47. 
um, and we're going to introduce, she, she shares a lot about PCOS and what it is and HA and how they, they can intersect. And it was a really good conversation. And we talked like very detailed about it, but to, I wanted her to come back because we ran out of time <laughs> to kind of dive into like, all right, what, how, how can we navigate the actual, I guess, investigation process and the actual, um, like seeing doctors and all of that good stuff. So welcome back to the show, Dr. Yay. Rhodes. Yes, yes. Thank you so much for having me, Danny. Um, I'm, I'm excited. I think it's going to be a popular series of episodes. I get a lot of questions about HA and PCOS, so I'm glad to just like have you come and be the person <laughs> to talk about it as much as possible. So we did discuss in the last episode like a great way to get back or to get on track with figuring out PCOS and HA, if you have a bit of both, blah, 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 it was back to basics. And I wanted to just like restart that conversation with that. So could you kick off quickly? What, what is PCOS? How does it sometimes intersect or get confused or whatever with HA? Yeah. So PCOS stands for polycystic ovarian syndrome. What it is, um, so the official diagnosis or official, you know, definition would be someone who has cysts on their ovaries, um, kind of consistently. Usually we see it combined with things like insulin resistance. Um, a lot of times, traditionally, it's been thought of as um, linked with having higher weight or being above ideal body weight according to medical standards, that good stuff. What we actually know now, since we've kind of dove a little more and there's a little more research and people are really trying to push this PCOS, like, you know, um, I don't want to say agenda, but really just trying to figure out like, what is PCOS and how do so many women have it, but don't have it. So the best way to explain it is that it really is an ovulation disorder. So your body is not ovulating for one reason or another which is how it intersects with HA because we obviously know that in HA that same process has, well, a process has occurred that has um, shut down ovulation. And so when we think about, you know, well, what is the difference? A lot of times we're thinking of how we got there. How did we get to the ovulation being shut down? So with HA, we know that we have that pituitary axis communication telling the ovaries like, hey, stop, we're, we're done with this. <laughs> in PCOS, what we usually see is levels of other hormones, we call them kind of accessory hormones that go alongside estrogen and progesterone that can't seem to balance out appropriately. So you may have um, really high levels of LH, which is a luteinizing hormone, which is the hormone that tells your body to drop an egg. So they can stay high all the time and your body never actually drops an egg because you didn't have enough of the hormone that goes alongside of that, um, which is FSH or follicle stimulating hormone. Sometimes LH levels are low and people are just like going in and out of like, we have tons of stimulating hormone. We have all these eggs ready to be dropped, but nothing ever comes up and tells them to do it. So with PCOS, we see more of... um, imbalances and different sources of the ovulation disorder than with HA. So um, when we talk about, you know, like, what do we investigate and what do we look into? There's a couple different causes for PCOS. And I like to tell people one of the main ones is that your stress system has taken over the show and shut down all your female hormones. And that is very similar in HA as well. Um, But other things that can come alongside PCOS are things like insulin resistance, um, as well as inflammation, as well as post-pill PCOS. So we have a couple autoimmune conditions can play a role here. We have a a good melting pot of things that can contribute to a PCOS uh, diagnosis. And there's also a lot of times you won't get a diagnosis, but your body is experiencing a irregular pattern of ovulation. So it's either not ovulating at all, or it's ovulating every like 60, 75, 90 days because of one of those other factors we just mentioned. Which, um, like, can you have more of one than the other if you have like a little bit of both? 
like HA and PCOS? Yeah. I believe so. Um, mainly because, again, we're just looking at those pathways. So what can happen with HA is either like the signal gets so shut down that your body's just like, no, we're not ovulating. We're not. And when your body, when your body gets that signal, like stop ovulating, the way it does that is through hormone changes. And so a lot of times, I don't think there's ever a way to know, like, this is more HA, this is more PCOS, or you have like 50% HA and 50% PCOS. What you're actually seeing, again, like PCOS just kind of ends up being this blanket term that I think people feel like they get diagnosed with and that's just what they have. I like to consider it more like a diagnosis of something like acne. Like you can have acne and then you can not have acne. Because your ovaries are always changing. So you can have PCOS while you're experiencing HA. But then you and I both know, like, you can change that situation. You can change your ovaries. And you can basically have the next month where you have no PCOS, no cystic ovaries, um, no symptoms of PCOS, but still possibly have, you know, some HA involvement or not a great connection there. Yeah. So you could see, like, the symptoms of one kind of clear up. Yeah. Um, all right, so I've had this question before, and I've, and I've also had a client with it that I was kind of like, we we went through this together a little bit, and I lent to this more towards like, I think you you just have HA because just because like her tendencies are that way. She didn't have you know acne or you know facial hair or any of the things. Her androgen levels appeared to be totally normal she had obsessive maybe not obsessive but like she just exercised and was a crazy crazy active and had a history of restrictive eating so it's like I know your doctors are saying you have it and I'm not saying that you don't have any kind of PCOS because I'm not an expert there <clears throat> but I can still see a million quadrillion things that we should work on right now just in the AJ space and she did she did get a period she did get pregnant so who knows, you know, what, what really happened, but her doctors were adamant, right? Two or three of them. This is, you, you don't have HA and this is what you have. And this is, she's not alone in her experience here. Do you have any insight in like, what is happening when someone's doctor is telling them like, this is a hundred percent what you have, even though our like self-research is isn't pointing towards that yeah that's really interesting because it happens the same way with um pcos too um i see women all the time that i'm like i mean your doctor can tell you all day long you don't meet the diagnostic criteria and that's cool i agree with that 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 diagnostic criteria is something a board of individuals met and said hey these are the things that are required to have PCOS. That doesn't mean that you don't, you couldn't still have symptoms. Your body couldn't still be fluctuating at all of that. I think we, we think we put a lot of, um, way too black and white. With yeah. Black. Yeah. And, and the reason we have to have those things, the reason that doctor, you know, as a medical society, we even have diagnoses really is, a, is linked very closely with insurance. So, you know, you have to have those black and white ways of being like, well, this is what I treated the person for. Before we had like an insurance, um, you know, system the way we do, a lot of times your doctor was just like, okay, I think this is what's going on and I think this will help. And we didn't have so much pressure to have these official diagnoses that we have all these tests to confirm and everything like that. And so even with PCOS. So my experience, like this sounds really similar to this client you had, um, everybody was insisting I didn't have PCOS. They're like, you don't have the androgen levels. Your cycles are regular. Um, you know, well, they would go in and out of regularity. Let me rephrase that. When I had a cycle, it was regular, but I would go through periods of HA where I knew it was my stress cycle had taken over and I wasn't getting a period. Um, but they were just so sure that I didn't have PCOS and I kind of got to the place where I was like, that's cool. I have all the symptoms. So if I have the symptoms and I know that this process in my body causes the symptoms, why wouldn't I address that process? And I think it's the same way with your client with the HA of like, even if, you know, she had PCOS and they kept saying it was PCOS, we really kind of 
Our treatments are different, but they're along the same pathway. And so it's kind of like, well, could we explore what to do in each of, can we take your symptoms and say, what could be the root cause? Could it be that you're not ovulating? Could you be not ovulating because of PCOS or could you not be not ovulating because of HA? And I actually think you can't have, I mean, it's so hard. So from like a Western medicine diagnostic criteria, technically you could have one without the other. When I think about PCOS as an ovulation disorder and what HA is, like you really, it'd be hard to, you could have a PCOS that's not caused by HA, but I think it would be hard to have HA and it not induce a lot of the symptoms and hormone imbalances we see with PCOS. Does that make sense? It does. Yeah. We are hosting an event that you are invited to. My co-HA coach, Ashley, and I are inviting you to a free five-day workshop called Mental Hunger Mindset Mastery. What a name, I know, but it really sums up what the workshop does and is really well. A very common concern around HA recovery is, what if I can't hear my hunger cues? And there's a widespread fear of accidentally over or under eating for recovery because we don't understand our mental hunger or lack thereof hunger and it's like mental hunger what's that versus actual hunger and I think this whole confusion around real hunger and the hunger that's just in my head and should I be eating this much and all all of that jazz it just really needs to be consolidated we need to get on the same page with this we need to feel better about it and get a plan of action (laughs) so we're going to turn it all on its head in this workshop over the five days we're going to work with you to understand what mental hunger is and why we have it we're going to teach you to partner with it both during and after recovery just for life and we're going to give you the tools and strategies that you need to listen to your hunger during the different stages and phases of both recovery and your whole life the workshop will go over five days starting november 12th and there'll be three live zoom calls Don't worry, there is a recording of every call if you miss one, and there'll be assignments for you to tackle on the days in between the live calls. So register for this free workshop now by heading to thehasociety.com forward slash workshop or find the link in the show notes. That's thehasociety.com forward slash workshop. Can't wait to see you in the Mental Hunger Mindset Mastery Workshop. Yeah, Yeah. Yeah. and would you say that like, when you have HA, especially if you've had it for a significant amount of time, yeah. years, yeah. you're going to have a buildup of like your your ovaries are probably going to appear cystic. Is so not everybody's will be cystic because again, it just depends on the specific and hormone imbalances. So a lot of times what can happen too, we know that hormones get imbalanced and they'll stay imbalanced for a long amount of time. And then they just say like, we can't suffice this imbalance, so let's just shut it all down. So if you have like all your, so if you get into like the adrenal fatigue realm, like those people probably don't even have polycystic ovaries because they don't even have the FSH enough of it sure. to even yeah. create the follicle stimulation they need to you have know, that. That's like, that's like a pleasant situation for a lot of HAs because it just makes their diagnosis like easier yeah. in, in a way, right? Yeah. <laughs> and then it's those those who we have been describing for most of this episode it's just where it starts to get like, oh my God, I have both. <laughs> I also think it's amazing that like people, like doctors are even diagnosing HA now because in my journey, like I'm not that far removed from it, probably like five-ish years. And um, I, I mean, no, I guess more than that. But I mean, I remember specifically two different doctors going and saying like, hey, I haven't had a period in nine months or however long. And like, they could see on my chart, I had lost a significant amount of weight very quickly. I told them I was running every day so many miles and that I tracked my food on my fitness pal, whatever. And like, it literally was just like, oh, we'll draw some blood work and everything came back fine. And they're like, you're normal. It's normal. I mean, like totally dismissed it. Like you were saying earlier, you know, if you fall into this criteria, which you need to because of which was really interesting to discover, like closely linked with insurance and stuff. Like yeah. their their clinic had the labs that they go off, like you were normal. 
right? Yeah. And this is what, and it's almost, it almost feels like sometimes our doctors don't have to do any creative thinking. And so like, you're lucky to find one who is, who is willing to look at the, at the charts, see that everything's like, I don't know, fitting the criteria, but still be curious about like, okay, well then why is my patient still seeing, still seeing these issues? But so many people, it's just like, they don't, they don't have to think past a certain point. Um, but, but like you were saying, you know, more people are diagnosing it. I think there's a change in like, you're a very, you're a young doctor, right? Like there is a change in how they're approaching it for a lot of them. We definitely come across those who are still like, you only, you, know, you only treat symptoms. Like we just treat symptoms. Uh, I have no idea why there's different doctors, <laughs> like why there's different people with different trains of thought. And is it like, is it just the circle you're running in? Is it the school that you go to? Is it the specialty you take? I don't know. You might know. But. Yeah. I mean, I think it's really interesting. One thing you mentioned about the creativity. I mean, I will tell you that Again, just from the time of my residency. So that was in 2013. So I'm dating myself. Eight years ago, I was in residency. And we had one doctor that oversaw all the PAs and everybody like that. Um, And he had a lot of devotion and commitment and time. And he was the only doctor in that entire hospital I felt like fought back against the system and they let him because he had been there so long and he was so brilliant. He had gone to Harvard, like all this stuff. Everyone else, unfortunately, not their fault, but the environment they worked in was even, I mean, even in my office, you're basically, your time is the most important commodity. And so we know, especially as business owners, women, moms, etc., that when you don't have any margin in your life, any margin in your brain, any margin in your time, then all creativity is squashed, right? So that's that I think is a huge piece of it of you can go to medical medical school and have like the best intentions or pharmacy school or whatever, nurse practitioners and and feel like, okay, this is gonna be so amazing. And then when you are in that grind and someone is on top of you and like, you know, if you go five minutes over, you're done. The rest of your day is just going to crap and you've got hours more work and all this stuff. Like you're not going to do it and you don't have the space to do it. And so I think that the critical thinking skills have been squashed a lot because of time, because of insurance risk, because of the healthcare system as a whole. And so that's why I think it does feel super rigid, super black and white, And that's what I keep finding, especially in the realm of hormones and hormone imbalances, is people will be like, I don't have PCOS, so I don't need that course or that program. And I'm like, I know you you think that. (laughs) I know you don't have that diagnosis. I know that what you have been taught about this condition is so different than, you know, what I can see with my experience. But I also know that if you applied these methods, this root cause kind of... um, strategy, protocol, et cetera, then you would see results because you may not ever get to the point where you meet that diagnostic criteria. So then what do you do? You're just going to stay stuck until then? Like you're just going to wait until your body gets so dysfunctioned that one day they say, oh, you do have it. Or you keep paying more and more doctors to finally one day tell you like, oh, okay, we did a little more research. We had a little more time. Here's what it actually is. Yeah, that makes me think of like that same client that I was t- talking about that she wanted to be proactive, but, you know, was feeling crippled a little bit by like, which direction do I go in? And it's like, honestly, I know that you and I are here working on HA together, but whatever we do is moving you forward, regardless of the diagnosis at this exactly. point. Uh, especially you had said earlier that the the treatments are like sort of similar. I do wonder though, um, do you think that's just like depending on the treatment? Because there's a lot of people who talk about the whole like all in method and just like focus on high calorie, like literally eat 
fried foods and heaps of candy and stuff. And that doesn't sound in line with what a, a PCOS protocol would be. No. Yeah. So it would definitely depend on like exactly what you mentioned. Um, and also the source of like why we suspect someone has PCOS. So like sometimes we don't know. Sometimes it's genetic. Sometimes um, I shouldn't say the source. I mean more so like the type of PCOS. So like if you have post-birth control PCOS, you wouldn't be doing the same thing that someone with HA has. But if you have adrenal-based PCOS and your stress system has taken over and your adrenals are shot, then we're probably looking at similar treatment um, depending on the treatment type you utilize, right? So like one of my things is definitely like we have to get your calories above your resting metabolic rate. We have to get you eating enough. But a lot of times I don't have as much of the mindset work to do as someone, as a client that has HA would need to do. Um, And that's where we get into the intuitive eating and the eating like anything and everything and high calories. And so I can see how someone who had PCOS, ideally no, your symptoms would probably get worse if you brought in all foods and ate fried foods and ate whatever. However, if your mindset needs to be healed, if that's a part of your mindset process, you will be able to address your PCOS nutrition from a much better standpoint than going from highly restricted, under eating, and then trying to like follow a different framework. It's really just dependent on where like your mindset is and your relationship with food is. Um, Because I don't recommend intuitive eating. I I won't say I don't recommend it, but a lot of what I do with PCOS specifically is I teach a framework, but if someone does it is it at a spot mentally and in their relationship with food and their body to be able to make choices that you know they can apply the framework and not freak out then they've got to go through that whole other process first and that's going to serve them much better in the long run than just trying to like muscle your way to PCOS results yeah I feel like intuitive eating is not a um like a protocol it's like some it's like a just how you might want to go about your diet after when you're Yeah, you're yeah. It's definitely <laughs> and again, it totally depends on if you are doing intuitive eating because like you read a book and you're just gonna start doing it. Um and a lot of times what I find too is that like I don't even love the word intuitive eating. Um, but I really think if you're in the place where like you feel like I can't get out of the diet cycle, I can't get to peace with my body intuitive eating probably isn't going to be your best bet unless you're, unless it's, let me rephrase that. I shouldn't say it's not going to be your best bet. What I mean to say is that intuitive eating alone isn't going to be your solution. Your solution really is, I feel like going to be working with someone who can help you through the mindset behind all of that. And you can do intuitive eating while doing it. But my whole point is like, what you're actually eating a lot of times isn't even the problem. It's your mindset around all of it. And I don't think intuitive eating alone is a strategy to fix a mindset and a body relationship and thought patterns that need rewiring. Yeah. It's kind of like a, I don't know, like a place that you eventually could arrive, which really just, it's, it is funny that it's like a big thing. We, we just went through all these fad diets over the last like three or four decades to land back at what if we just like ate what we felt, <laughs> felt like, but that's a different episode. <laughs> and I think too, like we have to consider even with intuitive eating that like you can intuitively eat, sure, but that doesn't mean that like an understanding of how certain foods will make you feel and how they'll impact your body is just ignored. Right. Because I could, if I'm intuitive eating, but having a lot of sugar, my body's going to crave sugar Mm -hmm. because intuitively I may not be thinking I want a lot of sugar, but I'm still putting it in and my body's going to have a physiological response. So it's again, kind of that same thing of like, you can't, you can't just use intuition and not consider the physical impacts that will happen from that. Um, 
it's like our kids. Our kids eat intuitively, right? But we still like regulate we break, we break it out of we break it out of them eventually. But, but they also like like if my kid was intuitively eating, he'd probably have three cinnamon rolls, ice cream cones, all of these highly palatable foods. And so that'd be great until I had to deal with his behavior because of it. So we kind of have to, like you said, break him out of it a little bit. Um, but I do think that like if we were just eating fruits and vegetables and meats and nuts and grains and like really like foods that didn't have all of those additives and sugars and preservatives and everything that make it taste amazing and change the way our palate kind of responds to it, it would be very, very different than intuitive I mean, now where we just could have like, yeah. you know, whatever we want. Yeah. When you're eating those things, your intuition is literally to keep eating those things. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> and then later on your intuition is like, that was not a great idea. <laughs> and it's like, we're trying to, we're trying to like, yeah, it's more, it really is more just like educated eating. Like, yeah. How do we, how do you make choices based on knowledge and like, you know, educated guesses yeah. and all that kind of thing is. But you know, I mean, you know too, though, that if you're not in the spot to even make an educated guess or an educated yeah. choice because your body's so deprived that like your craving center is activated and like you mentally like can't get to there, then you do kind of have to go through that cycle, right? Of like, yeah. how do we get to a place where now I can make educated choices? And I mean, I went through it. I think a lot of people with AJ have to go through it, especially if you've got binge eating disorder thrown, thrown in it's, there. It's probably one of my most frequent kind of concerns right hey I I cannot stop eating and I'm freaking out about it and and it's like I don't know if I'm gonna be able to to get past this because they're just like going from an extreme restriction to landing perfectly where you need to be is just like not a part of the process for a majority of people it's like you need to swing far to the other the pendulum needs to go all the way to the other side and you, you, your intuition will go, will call it for the sake of this yeah. is like figuring out how the hell to reset itself for something. Yeah. And yeah. it's fascinating. I went through it. You probably went through it. Yeah. You sort of like, you're suddenly starving at 5 a.m. <laughs> and you're yeah. waking up to eat and you want sweet things and salty things and, and you're like, this is crazy. It's a weird, it's kind of like being pregnant and you yeah. just, you're like, who am I? But it doesn't take long for it to, for the most people, it doesn't take long for it to like level out. There are some people who say, or at least it might just feel like it's been forever that their pendulum has swung all the way in the other direction. They cannot stop eating. And they're like, they feel incapable of having a regular relationship with food. But um, it's definitely possible, but it's definitely a part of the process for AJ is. Yeah, I definitely, I mean, I totally agree with that. And a lot of times too, like one of the things that I felt like made it take the longest for me is that I would go all the way to one side and then I'd freak out and white knuckle my way back to the other side and then go all the way again. And so rather than allowing my body to kind of find that natural medium, I tried to keep myself away from one side of the pendulum and that just made me swing even more for even longer, even harder. And our bodies too, I think one thing we forget is like our bodies intentionally overshoot and they do that as a safety mechanism to keep us safe based off of how long we have held so tightly to our eating patterns. And so when we think about like, you know, just like that total overshoot of, well, now I'm eating everything and it's so bad for my PCOS and I know it's going to make my PCOS worse and blah, blah. And I'm like, well, yeah, your PCOS may be worse for the next three months, but is that setting you up to be able to manage it and live with it and maintain balance for years later? Because right now you're not in the spot to even get to that middle point. Um, And I think that's a really important concept too, because people just start freaking out and think like, I can't deal with the weight or I can't deal with this or I can't deal with that. And I'm like, 
you've dealt with it for the last five years. So you can deal with it for another six months while we let your body do what it needs to do to truly change the path. But if you keep going down that same path where you've always been down every time and white knuckle your way back over to the other side, you're not getting anywhere. You're just staying in the same like dance, you know, per se, like for more years and years and years. And that was a huge thing I had to hold on to was knowing I had to do something totally different despite everything in my body being like, oh my gosh, if you do this, all of this will happen and you're making everything worse. And it just had to come to this this head of like, no, I have to do this because I have to do something different because I've tried everything else. Yeah. Basically everything we just talked, the last like five things we just talked about in a row, it just comes back down to like patience. I, I hate the term trust the process, right? But I don't know why I just like it. Um, but it, it is kind of it's like patience, right? We spent yeah. so long in this rigid space and we just want it to be fixed overnight. And I just like, I'm sorry, but it just doesn't really work that way. Yeah. And it's one of the benefits too, to working with someone, whether it be like a practitioner that you trust or a coach or something, because that like you if left to your own devices, you will go back, you will run back and you need someone to just like constantly be reiterating to you. This process takes time. This is what's meant to be happening. You should feel, um, you know, a bit like, whoa, this is yeah. a lot <laughs> or something. Yeah. It's, it's well, it's like a huge thing I see too, is that people think that what they're doing isn't working if they gain weight or if they're not losing weight. Right. But sometimes the healthiest thing for you to do in the season you're in is to let yourself gain weight. Because if that, again, is setting you up for a better, more maintainable, sustainable weight in five years or for the next five years, that's so much better than doing something that right now you feel like you have to see results from, like losing weight. And people will, you know, say like, I've been gaining weight and I know that's bad for my joints and I know it's bad for this and I know it's bad for that. And I just tell them like, no, you're not gaining weight because what you're doing now is pushing you, you know, further away from healthy. You're gaining weight because of how unhealthy everything you were doing before is. And you just have to trust that if your body needs to gain weight right now to get to a place where it can heal, let it do it. And that is more healthy than pushing yourself to do whatever you think you need to do to see weight loss right now in this moment or nothing's working. Yes. This is simply a result of, you know, society, right? Like being smaller is good. Losing weight is beneficial and it's everywhere. And if that friggin' narrative never existed, gaining weight for your health would make perfect logical sense. But the message we receive contradicts it and makes it so confusing and it muddies the waters. But if you could just like imagine none of that bullshit was there and you weren't getting like sold weight loss left, right and center and like told that this is what's great and getting compliments about how good you look and congratulations and shit, you know, gaining weight to solve an issue like this becomes extremely logical. Yeah. Yeah. Um, even doctors, like I'll even have, you know, doctor, like patients say, or clients say, um, you know, my doctor has said that like, I need to go on a weight loss medication because they gained weight while we were fixing their hormones. And I'm like, what? Like, we're just pushing you so far away from health at this point because they, and I get it that a lot of studies have showed, you know, that, being obese or having extra weight or obesity, fat, et cetera, can contribute, well, has a relationship with a lot of disease states. The problem is we have created this narrative that all of them are causative, that like, well, your weight is causing all of this and all this and all this. But we never, I don't feel like, um, I shouldn't say never, but there's not enough information that is being shared that says, what if the actual dysfunction that's causing the weight gain is truly what's causing this disease state or these outcomes or whatever. But instead we know, like we just look strictly at weight and we're like, well, if you're overweight, then you're more likely to have this, 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 and this wrong with you. But I'm like, well, if your weight's not where it should be, then whatever's causing you to be overweight is probably what's actually linked to all of these other disease states that you're now being told you that you should go on 
a weight loss medicine just to fix your weight that is going to have nothing to do with that underlying system and dysregulation and dysfunction that's caused the weight gain. It's, well, that's what we were saying earlier. Like there's just some doctors who just go symptom, fix symptom. Yeah. Bah. Yeah. But it's, it is comforting that there are many, many practitioners now that are just learned. <laughs> yeah. And again, it, I mean, we're going full circle here, but I mean, a lot of it does come back to too, insurance companies and reimbursements and all of that. Like there's incentive, like providers are incentivized to get their patients at certain weights and at certain uh, milestones that through data we think will make them healthier. Yeah, put, putting metrics on something that needs to be fluid is yeah very difficult. Yeah, especially when we link that to payment and money and how your business functions, you know, and, and, and it, that's a whole other piece of it too, is we forget. I mean, healthcare is a business. It's a very, mm-hmm. very... I don't poor... forget. You're in Canada, aren't you? I'm in the U.S. The U.S., in okay. Charleston, South Carolina. Beautiful. As an immigrant, <laughs> I have come to America and I've been like, this is a business. Like oh, yeah. other countries are not necessarily running it in exactly the same way and it is mortifying. <laughs> it's yeah. easy to see from, at least from my perspective, but I feel like most people are very aware that it's a business now. Like, yeah, it kind of makes it kind of scary. Like how can I, who can I trust? Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's a huge reason too, of how, when I was saying earlier, like, I think we're kind of getting more recent, like more is coming out and we're trying to figure out more about, you know, PCOS and HA and all of that stuff. And I think a lot of it is because patients are demanding more answers. And I think we're kind of hitting. And they're learning bit. more themselves. Yeah. Yeah. Like I noticed when I, before I started my business, I mean, every client I had, like their goal was to take less medications, but then the goal of, um, you know, just certain, uh, metrics and stuff inside of the healthcare system is to have my patients on more medications. And so like, it's so conflicting of a patient that is coming to a quote unquote business and wants certain results that they're not even able to learn how to have because the business needs, it's like someone going into a store and being like, okay, I'm going to come here and I really don't want to buy cake, but the store itself only gets, you know, gets an extra bonus if all their patients buy cake. And so you're like forcing this patient to buy cake when like the one reason thing they came into the store and said they didn't want to do is buy cake. (laughs) And so all my patients want to get better. They want to get off medication. And it's just such conflicting goals a lot of times between what your patient truly wants with the tools they have to execute that because there's a lot of patients that lack the tools that lack the education that lack you know what they need but then the doctors and the healthcare system itself don't have a lot of time to give those patients what they need especially with you know seeing someone once a month and then it and then it kind of being like well you know because they'll give patients diets all day long but if the patient doesn't stick to the diet, then it's like, oh, well, they just don't want to get better. And it's like, well, we don't understand those barriers and we need to learn more and all of that. And there is some health research that's diving further into all of that. But I think one of the things you and I really fight for with our clients is that education, because we know if you can change the way someone is educated about their body, you will change the way they treat, react, respond, and interact with their body. Yeah. I I I love that. And because I also think there's probably a piece with doctors too that simply don't want a, a don't feel comfortable. I don't know, with having a, cu- a patient come in and send them out with nothing, right? With yeah. just like, uh, there's definitely are people who do it and like, oh, you know, you just need to lose weight or whatever, and yeah. and the the client or the patient will walk out sort of feeling a bit disheartened potentially that he didn't give me anything. Like he, I feel like he gave up on me and. And the doctors don't want you to feel like they've given up on you. So it's like, well, if I give you this medicine, I'm, I'm handing you something tangible to do here. And what, well, at least what I do, because I don't, I can't prescribe shit, but um, I only send you away with nothing, <laughs> but nothing but like, okay, here's the next steps we're going to take with your lifestyle over the next two yeah, weeks. Yeah, yeah. And I think a huge piece of that too, though, is that, even though, so like 
you'll you'll always have clients that want one or the other and patients if you're in the doctor's office that want one or the other and so i think it is hard i think the people that want the actual help that want to take action that are action taking that are ready to do something different they're the ones that i see we're seeing on the other side that are investing in other ways to be held accountable because I think accountability is a huge piece of it. Sometimes all a patient needs is accountability, but again, there's no way for a business to make money be accountable if it's in an insurance based system. Right. I mean, sometimes, but for the, for the overarching sake of things, um, I think that charging people for accountability doesn't necessarily line up with, our healthcare system as a whole right now. And a lot of times that's what people need is that accountability. And that's um, why, you know, as practitioners, when we take on patients and clients, I know that if that's how, you know, a lot of times even setting prices that like, if I have a client that is working with me, then just by them investing in it, that puts some skin in the game for them. Whereas if you're going to a doctor and you have an insurance bill and like, sometimes you see it, sometimes you don't, sometimes you think you're getting something, sometimes you don't know, like, it's also confusing that a lot of times there's not a ton of skin in the game. Um, And I do think that that impacts results significantly as well. Yeah, that, that skin in the game that like, getting a client who wants to advocate and has come in and has done their own research is cool. Yeah. And yeah. the story. I love it. <laughs> I do. I love when I, I love it and hate it because most of the time those clients are so disserviced in the healthcare system by the time they get to me that I'm like so frustrated. However, um, I love working with them because we usually see very quick results. They do everything like to the mark. It, it, what I teach is it even like following my protocol to the mark. It's learning your body and doing certain things to learn your body and how it works and support your hormones and intentionality. And like those clients are the ones that I usually see have the biggest wins because they're not just trying to like check off all of these boxes, right? Mm-hmm. Which I'm sure they would love to be able to just do, but you know, no, we need to like, there's so many people, are you going to give me like a meal plan? And I'm not, I'm going to like help you figure it out because that's the only way to get you to actually get your money's worth out of these these sessions. Yeah. Yeah. That's how we become different than basically the other healthcare system, right? Because if we just gave you everything you needed or asked for to fix your problem, then we're not serving you any more deeply than the other healthcare system that's just giving you medications, right? So I think that's a huge piece of it is that we're like, no, we're going to help you actually get the results you want. Mm -hmm. And we do that through teaching you and serving you and, you know, allowing you to really step into that role as the expert. And we just like mentor you through it. Um, Because that's really how you change your health. You don't change your health by getting new meal plans and new supplements and new, you know, figuring out you have 50 gut sensitivities. I just had a call about that. Um, Because a lot of times that just keeps you stuck in the same cycle still. And so we really, I think both of us, I love that commonality between us and how we serve the women we do understand that like, if we're not teaching you, we're keeping you stuck in the same system with a different label. Yeah. Like I want you to fire me at some point. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> I want you to not need me. <laughs> yeah. And that's always the like I I freaking love canceling their accounts when it's like so I think that you're good. I mean, typically like they're pregnant, like they just got pregnant. And it's like so we didn't have like a whole lot to talk about anymore until you're ready (laughs) like yeah until post baby um so I guess this is over and I'll like just check in with you next month and (laughs) I I love that feeling of like finish uh you know reaching a point where like I'm ready for you I'm ready or you're ready to take the next step that you need to take and I'm here for you if you need me but like you don't have to rely on me (laughs) exactly exactly and that I think again is like 
so refreshing to like have someone. Yeah. I mean, exactly what you said. It's so different of like, no, we don't need a follow up in three weeks or whatever, uh, which is how we used to do it at the doctor's office because and that was my goal was like, let me get you set up. It's so good that like, you don't have to keep coming here every month because talk about getting sick. You're going to get sick if you keep coming here every month. <laughs> yeah, and it's like, I'm not worried about getting, you know, filling your slot because if you're getting results, you're going to send people my way. So yeah. I'm not worried whatsoever that yeah. you're no longer paying anymore. Anyway, just that's a, that's a different thing, but Okay. We're nearly out of time. I just want to get from you some advice for people who are just like, okay, where where do I start? Where do I go? With their, like working within their insurance, I suppose, right? Like their doctors, how do they ask for this help? How do they advocate for themselves? And what if they're not getting the help they need are the next steps that they could take? Yeah. So I really advocate having a healthcare team. So what that looks like is still go to your primary care, still have, you still want the doctors you have to be people that align with your values, that you feel like you can trust, that listen to you, that you're not feeling dismissed. Like, again, it's a business. So you get to choose who you do business with. And I think we forget that a lot, especially as women in a healthcare system of like, if you're feeling pushed around, if you're not being serviced, like if it's sucky, go somewhere different. And a lot of times we think like, oh, well, insurance, I'm not going to pay or I'll have to pay more. And I'm like, it's worth every dollar because you will end up paying more every single time through your time, through your energy, through your frustration, through what you do Googling, through what you try that doesn't work if you do not have alignment with your provider. Step one. The next thing I say is, again, you want that team. So if you have something really specific that you want to become the expert in, that you want to truly get to the root cause, then you do want someone who is a expert in that specific area. So whether it be a hormone expert or a gut health expert or a, a fertility expert, someone like that on your team that's going to be there like holding the GPS and guiding you. So that way, when you are working with other members of your, like of your healthcare team, you go in more empowered. So that's like one of my favorite things is teaching women like, okay, keep your doctor. I'm not replacing your doctor. Like you still have your primary care doctor, but now when you go and have a conversation with him and he tries to tell you to take a weight loss drug, you know exactly why you do not need that. And that's not the choice you're taking. And you have now made empowered decisions for your healthcare. And that's going to get you results. It's going to make you healthier. It's going to end up serving you so much better in the long run. So I think that's kind of a huge piece is to make sure that you have a team and that it's a team you trust and that you're constantly learning from an expert on your specific um, you know, whatever that goal may be that you're looking for, whether it be like, I've got acid reflux or I want to get pregnant or I'm struggling with hormone balance or my period suck, like whatever that may be. Um, and then I would say, you know, so you've got your team, you've got a doctor that you align with. Um, we can't like forget having patients and understanding, you know, all of that side of things is going to be really, really important. Um, and I really do. I feel like if you've got both of those things, you're you're kind of set. But when it comes to, you know, what specifically with PCOS do we want to be encouraging you to do? It's advocating for yourself. It's, you know, telling the doctors, hey, like when they say your thyroid looks normal, say, okay, but I still have all the symptoms of this. So is there anyone, like, is there any data to say I could have subclinical, you know, uh, hypothyroidism or thyroid involvement or whatever? Or is there anything I can do that even if my levels are normal, I could support it then be closer to that, you know, ideal range or whatever it may be. Um, so I think advocating for yourself would definitely be another huge piece of it too, to make sure that you are going in, that you are staying the expert, that you have a team that is serving you to get closer to your specific goals. Um, and then if you still feel like nothing's working, I'm not being, I, I just tell people all the time, like if you are being completely dismissed and underserved, like it will be worth it in my opinion to go and explore possibly functional medicine, integrative medicine, holistic medicine, naturopathic, like find someone who aligns with what you want. If you want somebody to tackle the basics with you, 
then have an expert tackle the basics. If you want someone that can deep dive into root cause and, you know, find out everything that's happening in your gut or your ovaries or whatever, then go go find someone who will do that um, in alignment with what you value. And so sometimes, I think most of the time that looks like, you know, again, having a team that utilizes methods that just are very different than here's a medicine. I'll see you in six weeks. <laughs> yeah. And I think one of the wonderful things about the the world, the time we live in now is that there are people just like you who are like, you know, I, this is going to be like my thing. I, I specialize in this and I'm going to care about it. And yeah. I'm going to understand the nuances of like, and like where you've been. So, um, I feel like if you were a doctor 20 years ago, you would probably be a general practitioner or something, right? Like you would be just doing all the things. But now we live in a world where you kind of get to like choose your client. And that means there is now opportunity for people to go and find like the PCOS doctor, the HA doctor, the infertility doctor. And get, if, if no one's listening to them in their current health space, like, you can almost always now find someone who's kind of specializing in it. Even like, even if someone's not like the best doctor in the world or whatever, like however you'll gauge that shit. Um, Just having someone who like gets it and cares is going to get you way more results than, you know, going to someone who has like more, accolades behind their name in a a general sense. And that goes back to the system too. So even when we think about those accolades and all of that, those things you could have behind your names and all of that, um, I think it's really important to understand that a lot of those things come at a price point. Again, it's a business. Mm -hmm. Um, And also that they don't mean anything if that person with all of those accolades does not listen to you and cannot teach you what those accolades have even equated to in a real life situation that you benefit from. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I love it. <laughs> Thank you. Where can people go and find out more about you and work with you and all that good stuff? Yeah. Yeah. So one thing I didn't even mention, we talked so much about PCOS is a lot of times what I found was like the biggest disservice is what women with PCOS are taught about nutrition. So I have a freebie called um, Overcoming Overwhelm with PCOS Nutrition because it just teaches you little swaps to make. Like if you have no idea what to do and how to even start making some changes, here are just some basic swaps. So you can grab that on my website, www.drheatherrhodes.com. I am most active on Instagram, at Dr. Heather Rhodes. Um, And those would be the best places to connect. I also have a freebie in my Instagram link. Um, bio that talks about um, your next three, your three next best steps. So if maybe PCOS isn't something you're particularly going after, but you know, your hormones are playing a role in something you're experiencing, whether it be migraines or fatigue or libido or fertility or whatever it may be. I have three steps that are an absolute minimal requirements to get your hormones back into a supportive state to intentionally support them. And that also is available on my website. Amazing. Um, I wrote all that down. It's going to be in the show notes for everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. That was a great conversation. I know we went all over the place, but those are my favorite. Um, I know. It was so good. Thanks for having me again. Of course. Bye, everyone. Thank you so much for listening today, guys. Please subscribe to the podcast. And if you could head to iTunes specifically and leave a rating or review, that would help so much because it makes it easier for other people with HA who are Googling around to find the podcast really easily. So if you do that, you're doing a service to all of the women. If you've got a passion for pumpkin, you've got to get to Dunkin' and pick these up. Our new pumpkin cream cold brew. Smooth, bold cold brew topped with velvety pumpkin cream cold foam. And our delicious pumpkin spice signature latte. Rich espresso topped with whipped cream, caramel drizzle, and cinnamon sugar. And our perfectly pumpkin donuts, munchkin treats, pumpkin muffins, and more. That's how we pumpkin at Dunkin'. Pick your pumpkin at Dunkin', like our new pumpkin cream cold brew. Pumpkin spice signature latte. And our perfectly pumpkin treats. America runs on Dunkin'. Price and participation may vary. Limited time offer. Exclusions apply. Hear that? Is that America cheering or a sausage patty? 
sizzling to perfection. It's time to cheer for Egg McMuffin and fresh cracked eggs at McDonald's. It's time to wake up to the aroma of freshly baked biscuits and treat yourself to a real honest-to-goodness morning meal. Breakfast, it's on at McDonald's. Now enjoy a large iced coffee for just two bucks and a breakfast sandwich to make a meal. Prices and participation may vary. Cannot be combined with any other offer or combo meal. 